If you had to choose one word to characterize your life right now, what would you choose? Would you choose something like stressed or overwhelmed? Or would you choose something like joy? The truth is so many of us would love to have lives characterized by abundant joy, but we seem to miss the mark a lot. There's family drama, there's just everyday work stress, family stress, so much going on that just leaves us weary and worn out and stressed. So that's why I'm so excited to introduce to you today Jane Jenkins Herlong, author of the book Rhinestones on My Flip Flops, Choosing Extravagant Joy in the Midst of Everyday Mess-Ups. In this interview, Jane is sharing with us some of her backstory and some of the challenges that she has been through in her family and how she overcame them and was able to find extravagant joy. So if you are ready to dive in and enjoy the life that is full and abundant that God promises us in John 10.10, 10, I really hope you will stay tuned for this interview. All right, today we have Jane Jenkins Herlong, best-selling speaker and author of the book, Rhinestones on My Flip Flops. Thank you, Jane, so much for talking to us today. Thank you, Brittany. All right, well, why don't you get us started by just telling us a little bit about your story and a little bit about your background for any of our readers who might not be familiar with you. Well, I started out as a professional speaker and then the the adage was if you have a speech you have a book if you have a book you have a speech so i decided to write a little tiny book and i just called it um, bare feet to high heels uh, you don't have to be a beauty queen to be a beautiful person and it was just fun because i was in the miss america pageant and i went from the rows of the tomato fields on john's island outside of charleston south carolina to the runway of the miss america pageant so i just i just said you know this is a fun little book whatever and I had it for many years, and then I really became more interested in writing. And uh, my sister got breast cancer, and she survived it, thankfully. And I wrote a little book, um, sadly, though, in her memory, because she also had a heart problem. And she passed away shortly after my mother passed away. It was a really hard time for me. But I wrote this little book, and it's got a little edgy title, but it's not an, it's not an edgy book. It's called What Tatas Teach Us. And then that led to Bury Me With My Pearls. And then that led to Rhinestones on My Flip Flops. The book is interesting because what I have done in that book is I have isolated emotional issues that women face. And I have highlighted them in biblical, iconic biblical women like Deceived Eve, Domestic Diva Martha, Salty Mrs. Lot. And uh, I, I have, I'm a humorist, so I make, you know, have funny stories. But I'm the, probably the nicest review I've ever gotten for the book. And I mean, it's, I'm not trying to sell a book, but I'm just saying that if you were to read the book, you will see there's a timeline and it deals with every stage of life, whiny Naomi, who God blessed, you know, in the end. But I've got a season of for every woman in her life. And someone said that one time when they read it and that really blessed me. I didn't really realize it. So um, that's what I did. And they're flip flops and they're sparkle and shine. And just like with Eve, there was no sparkle and shine. She had to accept her consequences. So it's an interesting little funny book. And uh, I'm just so thankful to have that out for folks to read. But my first love is speaking. But my big love is helping women be emotionally stable. Because I've seen it in my own family and what anger and bitterness can do. So I appreciate what you talk about because that's kind of what I believe in too. So tell me some more about what that looks like. Oh, mental stability. And my sister so, was just eaten up with bitterness and anger. And I just think it, I just think it took her life. I really do. I think emotional wellness is huge. And I've, I get very passionate about that. And I, and I, you know, I never understood why the Lord allowed me to go through this very hard time with my mother's estate and my father's will and my sister, you know, basically there was a green streak in her that grew and I just, 
I hated it for her because she was such a wonderful, fun person. But I really, and I don't mean to sound weird, but I really think the enemy does prowl around and uh, catches us at our weak, weakest moments. And I just saw a personality flip. I have never seen anything like it. It's like I didn't know her anymore. And it just broke my heart. So I've kind of made a mission, although I'm a humorist and it makes it a little awkward, and I'm definitely not making fun of anyone who has issues because it can be very debilitating. And I just see it just, it's just a nasty, like a cancerous, mental cancerous um, state of mind that can wreck your life. And I've just made it a point to really try to talk to women about mental wellness. Yeah, I know in your latest book, which I'm really interested in, I haven't read it yet, I want to though, um, Rhinestones on My Flip Flops, you write about choosing extravagant joy. Can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like um, in today's life? What does it look like to pursue extravagant joy? What does it look like when we have extravagant joy in our lives? I think you're just peaceful. I think that Every day you wake up and you're excited that it's another opportunity to serve and it's an opportunity to take the journey you've been through, whether it, it, and I just say, you know, you make a mess into a message and I, I think you have to have something to live for and you have to have hope and you have to have goals. The Bible says without vision we perish. So whatever your goals are, whatever your dreams are, don't lose those and revisit them and try to get excited again. And I think when you serve people, Brittany, I think you get excited about working hard and making things happen, not in a selfish way. Now, that will destroy the message. But I think in a positive way, you can take that message that God has burned on your heart and you can externalize it in so many creative ways so you can help other folks. And I know that sounds real old, old beauty queen, but I love to help people be better. I love to help people be a better version of themselves. Yeah, that's totally my mission at Equipping Godly Women too. And I always hesitate because I don't want to tell people, oh, you're not good enough because of course, you know, we're wonderful. We're a creation of God, but there's always room for improvement and always just ways that we can step more fully into everything that God has for us. And just being able to see that is really wonderful. Um, can you tell me some more? I know that you kind of touched on briefly some hardships that you had been through in your life. Can you tell us just a little bit more about what that looked like to find joy during those hardships? Like how were you able to find joy when your sister's not doing well, when your mother's not doing well, and all these things are going on around you? It was truly the hardest time of my life. And to be honest, I already felt like the Lord had a goal and a mission for me. And every time something would happen that would be of some substantial value, because I have a brother who struggles with crack cocaine addiction, I kept thinking, well, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. And when this thing hit, I knew this was what the Lord had for me. It's my, and it was with my father's estate. And uh, my, my brother-in-law, we trusted him. And you know, I, I've had to forgive him and I have to say it through gritted teeth, but, um, a lot of times, um, unforgiveness in your heart will hold God's best for you, for you to see bigger pictures. It's like blinders just drop from your eyes. And so, um, unforgiveness is a horrible thing to walk around with. And I've, I've always said that to be a victim of someone who bullies you or hurts you is bad. But to have that seed in you is terrible. I can't imagine living with trying to hurt people. I mean, I've been the victim of it, and I just had to pray through it. I kept hearing my daddy's voice saying, you get this right. Don't you let this slide. Your mother needs to have her estate and my estate in order. And I think that the telling part was, you know, you think, well, this will never happen to my family. There was no way. And we were all sitting around and all of a sudden my sister said to me, you had a bigger wedding than me. And I knew it right then. I said, this is terrible. And it was a seven year battle and to have godly behavior. And I read, oh my gosh, Brittany, I read and read and read. I remember going to the lake on my son's birthday with a book, trying to give myself some kind of peace. And just seeking out and going, God, why am I going through this? 
why am I not going around it, over it, or under it? What What is this? And it was awful. And I, I think I hurt more from my mother because my mother gave my sister some beautiful property right on the water on an old plantation my daddy bought back in the 60s. My daddy didn't have a 10th grade education. He dropped out of school. And my sister built this amazing house. It's a multi-million dollar house. And she was so unhappy. And all of a sudden, she just didn't want that track of property. She wanted all of what she would get at my mother's death. And it was my mother's. So that started it. And I just had to have high principle thinking and not low functioning reacting. Very tempting to be a low functioning emotional person. But I had to pray that, I mean, I prayed and I prayed. And let me tell you, talking about how to get through these times, seven years of this, I would go outside and I would lie down in the grass and I would look up and I would I would tell myself this is a big world you are a small part of a big world don't make this issue bigger than it is get it in control and I would just have to ask the Lord to give me laborers across my path just to help me I went to counseling I did anything because I didn't want it to pull me down and it would you know the enemy uses times like these Brittany to ruin us his goal is to kill, to steal, and destroy. And we've got to fight that. And as women, as time unfolds and life unfolds and our children don't turn out exactly the way we want them to turn out, we might have prayed our you know, holes in our knees. But for some reason, God is leading us down a path for his good if we just stay steady and we just seek joy. I surrounded myself with praying friends. I mean, I've got a list of things I did to help me be mentally well through a very mentally challenging time. Yeah, I would love to just hear any advice or tips you have. I feel like so many people are dealing with stress these days, whether it's something big or even just in the day to day, there's so many little things that absolutely just rob us of our joy. Um, if I can be totally honest, like lately I have been very grouchy and for no good reason like everything is fine and wonderful in my life but just not having the joy that I know that I could have in the Lord what advice would you have either for me or for any of my listeners who just say you know what like there's nothing huge and wrong that's going on but we're just in this cycle of being grouchy and we just don't have that joy do you have any advice for a situation like that I think the best thing we can all do is wake up and pray to God you can sleep. I would pray, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and a sound mind. I would pray that all the time because fear truly can grip us and take us from God's best. So I would wake up every day and I'd say, Lord, thank you that I have a home, that I have a wonderful husband, that I have two children, that I have a, I have a, a, a nice place to live with good friends. And I would just praise him even, I mean, just to thank you, God, that the water's running in my sink. We have electricity. I mean, sometimes, seriously, you got to dig. But when you see darkness and you allow that veil of darkness, it's very hard. I mean, I've never known depression, but I've known good friends to have struggles with that. And that's a terrible thing. And unless you've walked through it, and I'm not going to pretend I have, I could have been very depressed, but I just kept trusting that God would give me and I would say Lord just send me something it'd be little things I mean I'm a singer so I was riding down the road just praying I said God please give me something to lift me up today you know my heart I'm down the dumps and all of a sudden I heard myself singing on the radio and I'm going oh. I mean it was like God answered that little prayer he's listening all the time and he knows our hearts I mean it's just communicating or I would just find the right book, or I'd see the right message. And I mean, I would watch Joyce Meyer all the time because she'd been sexually abused over 200 times by her father. And I think if you think about what other people have been through, and you have to realize that, that your issue, it might be big to you, but in the light of eternity, there's so many other people. Go to a nursing home. That's what I did. I love my elderly friends, and I miss them. They're gone now, a lot of them. I just go see them. And I'd sit around and not have a giant pity party. 
And I'd say, let me go see Miss Honeycutt. I love Virginia. Let me go to the nursing home. Let me do something for someone else. Let me cook something. So get your mind off of you. Does that make sense? That's the big thing that you cannot wallow in your own pity party because you're the only guest at that pity party for sure. So I understand that forgiveness is incredibly important and in getting that anger out of our lives. But how do you walk through that practically speaking, especially when there are things that are still going on in your family? Well, the first thing you have to do, Brittany, is you have to gritted teeth say, I forgive you in the name of Jesus. That's power right there. But the Lord told me, you forgive her. And even my Christian friends said, what? Why? You've done it. You've been to her. You've tried to pray with her. It's just like she was, she was just gone. I mean, I think the enemy had a grip on her. I really do. Just a grip. So I remember I was at, a, at an oyster roast. It was over Christmas. And I said, Lord, this is your show. I'm willing. And I'm telling you, the crowd parted and there was my sister. I walked up to her and I said, if I've done anything to hurt you, I'm sorry. And she looked at me like, what? Like, okay like that and I was surprised and do you know almost one year to that day is when she died and I knew that I did everything in my power and then some to try to help her get away from all of this mental anguish and that was the Lord now had I not been obedient my conscience would probably be beating me to death but you've got to do the right thing regardless of the way you feel you've got to you've got to forgive I mean, the, right next door to me, right here, is a jewelry store. The finest Christian couple. They were robbed, held by gunpoint, tied, and they were supposed to be murdered. They just finished the trial probably last, last week. And these guys got life plus. And that my sweet friend Danny said, I want to speak to the gentleman who you just sentenced, who tried to kill us. He walked in and he said, I'm a follower of Christ and I forgive you. And the man just wept and wept and wept and wept. Now that is only through the power of Jesus Christ could that happen. But that's what forgiveness does. It has nothing to do with this. It has everything to do with this. You get this straight, this gets straight. And the enemy does not want you to forgive. Does not want that. Wants you to stay in bondage. So you have to break through that bondage. And it's very hard. I mean, I went to a Christian counselor. And I and thank God I went to him because after my mother's death and I had to grieve that because we were very close, I had to deal with this family hatred that I just, I said, you know, there's nothing I can do. People are going to think what they want to think, even if it's a lie. And some people like to believe lies so they can survive. It's crazy, but that's on them. That's not on me. I've forgiven them. So I want to ask you a kind of a bit of a different question. You mentioned a minute ago that you said you were trying to really help your sister as she was battling all this negativity in her life. Do you have any advice or tips for those of us who have other people in our life who are really dealing with negativity that we could use to kind of help them? Is it possible to help other people or is it really just something we have to deal with ourselves? I think you can try. I think the Lord told us you can go in and share what you know you've got to pray first. Pray. Really feel led to do it because it can backfire in your face if it's not the Lord centered. And I think you can try. But I think after that, and you have the wisdom, just while I love that serenity prayer, you have the wisdom to know what you can control and what you can't. And um, I, I write a newsletter every week. And uh, I said the most powerful word in the English language to me is whatever. Not the little adolescent, whatever, not that. But just saying, God, I trust you. And I know you're going to, you know, my heart is right. And see, this is the thing, Brittany. Sometimes the Lord is showing us what's inside of us. It's, it's not necessarily about the issue. It's about, I think, I think everybody is like a tube of toothpaste with a key winding up the tube and that's life and that's pressure what comes out of that tube is what's in your heart god might be using these times to show you what's in your heart and you better pay attention and you better just pray through it but i think you need to be led to confront if that person does not act upon it move on move on you know the bible says you're not supposed to be around angry people 
And there's a reason for that because it gets into your spirit. I mean, I know when, when my children were little and they would watch really sweet videos and I would always get, there was no such nice video company except a Mormon video company, but their stuff was awesome. My children would be so loving and so sweet to each other. And if I put something, you know, if they saw something that I didn't like them to see that was a little more aggressive, they were aggressive. So what you let in your mind can get so into your soul and your spirit. And it's going to come out that way. It's the same principle as the old computer term, garbage in, garbage out. You know, if I banged on my keyboard and press, press print, that's going to come out what I banged on the keyboard. Garbage in, garbage out. So you have to be really careful of that. But, you know, you have to, A, feel led to do it, pray yourself up, confront if you feel led to do so in a healthy way, and then if that person does not act upon it, you move on. Don't you stay around there. You know, you can help people that don't want help and ruin your life in the process. That's true. What about if the, and this is just hypothetical, just from emails that I've gotten from my readers and situations that I know people are dealing with. What about if the person in your life is somebody who is family? And it's gotten to the point where you have tried to help them and you've done everything that you can and you've prayed and you've talked to them and they just are still, I guess the word is toxic. Like just being around them is just draining you. Is there a point where it is okay even with family to say, okay, that's enough. I'm going to have to draw a boundary here. Or is there some kind of concession because they're family where you really still need to love them? and love them and love them even if it's having a negative impact on you. You love them at a distance. I have a brother who, as I mentioned, has a crack cocaine problem. I cannot have a relationship with him. Um, I was so hoping he's been rehabbed. He's 62. No, he's 72. 72 years old. And he's lost. He's been married five, six times. He has, you know, children that are very affected they're you know one one son has done incredibly well because he's learned from his father but they're i can you know they're all emotional emotions running in different ways many times and i think my heart just aches and i've done everything i've tried everything and there just comes a point i think i remember with my sister i was in this little john boat on our little creek and i was turning the corner and I was so burdened and the Lord said you are released you are released pray for them you are released my brother too I felt that release this is not your problem anymore you've done everything you were supposed to do you're released and that was one of the greatest days that I knew I wasn't responsible anymore and you just have to pray for God to give you the wisdom to know just like I go back to that serenity prayer but I don't think you're obligated. You can love people because Christ told you to. I don't know. I heard a telecast and it was Joyce Meyer because her mother knew what was going on with the sexual abuse and she did nothing. And her mother asked her one time, this is very powerful. She said, do you love me? And she said, I love you as Christ taught me to love you, but I do not love you as a mother. Now, I'm telling you, that's strong. But she had every right to say that. And she knew exactly what she was talking about. So many people, and see, I was caught up in that trap. Oh, I have to love them with the love of Christ. And so they'll change. Well, no, they have to choose. God gives us a free will. And he's telling me, and I've had to learn this the hard way, stay away from them. Do not engage. I mean, the last time I talked to my sister's daughter, she said, well, there are people in the family that want me to hate you. I said, honey. Don't you dare let their problems infect you. That is dangerous, very dangerous for them. I said, I'm here for you, but don't you let other people dump their issues on you. And I haven't spoken to her since, but I did my part. I told her I loved her. I was here for her. But you, you can't help that someone has chosen to act the way they act. I mean, again, you could spend your whole life trying to help people that don't want your help and ruin yours in the process. So you've got to get up in front of yourself, put them in a place where I will pray for you, but this is it. Because many times we enable that behavior to continue and it affects us. So you've got to protect yourself, but have the wisdom 
to be God, to be led by the Lord. That's the key right there. Yeah, I think a lot of times we forget when you go into the Gospels, um, we kind of go with this expectation that, oh, Jesus is just love and he just loves everybody. And he does. But when you go back to the Gospels and you see the way that Jesus treated people, it's honestly shocking if you are not in there reading it constantly. Jesus was not just so sweet and kind and loving to everyone. The things that he said, I'm like, is Jesus allowed to say this? Because he is very serious of, hey, you have a choice. You can walk in truth with me or you cannot. And if people are choosing to go a different way, that doesn't mean that you necessarily need to be with them all the time. And there's a boundary. Right. You've got, I mean, Dr. Henry Cloud wrote a great book called Necessary Endings. And that's very harsh. I know that. But when you are dealing with people that are spaced out on drugs, you need to protect yourself. So before we wrap up here, let me just ask you one more question. For those of us who are dealing with all kinds of just drama and issues in our life, what are just really practical things that we can do to increase the joy in our life? I think you have to quote scripture, get the powerful scripture, the words that Jesus spoke. I think you have to count your blessings. I think you have to listen to music that uplifts you. I think you have to um, do something for other people because you can have your own, you can be so absorbed in your own problems. And I think you have to make a determination that you are going to have a barrier and you need to protect your heart. Well, thank you, Jane, so much for talking to us today. It has been just so nice getting to hear more of your story and to hear more of your practical wisdom for us today. Um, definitely for everyone listening, if you need more joy and encouragement in your life and a good dose of humor, absolutely go to Amazon or wherever books are sold and check out Jane's book, rhinestones on my flip-flops it has great reviews it is definitely good for a laugh and it will definitely encourage you in whatever you are going through today so thank you jane so much for being here with us today thank you all right so that wraps up our interview for today if you would like to hear more from jane definitely make sure you check out her book rhinestones on my flip-flops choosing extravagant joy in the midst of everyday messes or her website which can be found at janeherlong.com alternately if you loved this interview and you are excited to watch more just like it definitely make sure that you subscribe to this channel i am just going to be bringing you so many interviews with women of all walks of life so no matter what it is that you are dealing with no matter what it is that you are struggling with today i will have all kinds of encouragement and practical tips for you as we live out this life as godly women so go ahead subscribe and i will see you back here real soon Bye.